Let's get ready to talk to the man himself. We're about to talk to the baddest builder on this side of heaven. Now, there's all kinds of goats in all kinds of industries. When you start talking about building cars, if you ask me my opinion, the greatest of all time, of all we're talking time. to him right now. Meet Bob Smith. Bob, how you doing? I'm doing great today. Good. The greatest of all time. The Talk with the man himself, Bob Smith of the legendary Bob Smith Coach Works, based here in Texas, Gainesville. I am so happy, Bob, you've allowed us to come in and glean your wisdom and just hear your story and basically sit at the footstool of greatness. How does that sound? Oh, that's pretty good. I think mean, I don't think about greatness. Uh, I like to surround myself with great projects and where we've been and where we're going and I like to share. Now Bob I know you're into the horses you know so some say the greatest thoroughbred of all time is Secretariat. You know if you're into baseball they say the greatest one of the greatest players is Babe Ruth. You're into basketball maybe it's Michael Jordan. If you're into building cars guess who they say it is? Bob Smith. Oh really? Yeah what do you think about that? Hmm that's pretty cool. <laughs> Bob, tell us a little bit about, because we all start with a dream. We all start at square one. For you, that was growing up on a farm and and, 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 and and just ranch community, things of that nature. And when you first started your career, you started with Chevys and Fords and whatever you could get your hands on. How did you go from that to this? <laughs> Well, that's, that was, it's been a good journey. And starting out in the beginning, working on whatever I could get in the shop to make money to, to be to the next step. And um, once we started working on those and street rods and other cars, the, and going to shows, going to Autorama in Dallas, some of the other shows around, and then getting involved with groups of club members with different types of clubs, whether it was Jaguar, Mercedes, Ferrari, and involved with those, and then working for customers that discovered me. And then one thing led to another over the years. And the whole company started from an upholstery shop. Hmm. And um, that, that was when you first started, upholstery was like your home run pitch. That was your main that was what that, the company. what you were known for. That's what it started out. Wow. With, and going to college, I went to OSU Tech, and I have a degree in um, machine shop. And um, uh, if I'd had a lot of money when I got out of college, I'd probably be in the machine tool business. But hmm. you know, starting the company with. Well, this, we sure have you have no money. <laughs> still <laughs> having money, have a lot of fun, but. Um, and starting the company with 50 bucks and $135 box of tools and no credit, um, it's 47 years ago. It's, and I look back and I go, boy, where did the time go? And, but all the people along the way that I've met, and customers and acquaintances around the world, uh, explain my life in a lot of ways. A lot of people think of the fairy tale. Yeah, yeah. And I've lived the dream. You're living the dream. And the shop that Coach Works was a dream that I had being a kid growing up on the farm. My little workshop that I had there when I built when I was 14 is having a shop, surround yourself with master craftsmen, and could make anything that we set our mind to. A 
That's Coach Works. Well, man, you're doing it. Now, when we sit here, uh, those at home or those listening may think that we've staged this shot. But really, we're just in the shop. These cars are already here. Oh, yeah. They're pretty much in this spot. Oh, uh, there. Well, the one behind us is 275 GTB 4 cam. It's one we're doing an engine for. That's uh, for a past customer. This one is one that's. Uh, I get cars that come to me that've been restored and not restored safely, and kind of restoration rescue type of stuff. Well, yeah, I could put it in that perspective. Is um, making it safe, making it work, and you know, a lot of shops they can do nice paint and they do nice upholstery, but getting the detail and making it safe and making it work, they sometimes fail. Hmm. And then the other car that's behind us, it's one that we're. Uh, starting to dismantle and do things too that's going to Pebble Beach in 2023. And there's multiple other cars in the shop that we're working on in various stages of restoration. And there's not any way you can just have one car and finish it. You have to have cars in multiple stages to keep the staff working and keep the flow going. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, it, it'd be kind of like an assembly line, but not. You know, the car's not going down a, a line and putting on a carburetor or putting the wheels on it or what. There's a, there's a process, there's a rhyme or reason, there's yeah, a flow. Yeah, well, you, you have to have a... You have to have cars in different phases to keep that flow. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And keep the, keep the staff busy, because you've just had one car and you've got a fabricator and he does his part. And, he can't, you don't want to send him home for six months and you call him back, he might not be there. <laughs> right, right. Now, Bob, I know probably when you first started, if anything, we might call you a trimmer or a, yeah. or, or, or a master woodworker or whatever someone, whatever your day-to-day -day title was in the beginning. Now we might call you the maestro. There's a great uh, band, there's a great <laughs> orchestra that you uh, have here. and You lead uh, this symphony called Bob Smith Coach Works. Tell us a little bit more about well, still, what you do every day. Well, I'm still a janitor. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, well, reading my list because I'm one is about a list maker, and I make a list for the list. And, a list for the list. Oh, yeah. I work with five lists. Hmm. Like at, at home, when I go home at night, I'll have five or six lists going, and one of them will be for... Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday uh, ahead, what's got to happen. And then I'll make a list of things that I need to do each day. And then I'll have a list maybe of things that people that need to call or return calls or things of that nature. And um, then when I get to the shop that everybody that's, all the guys here, if they need something, I say hello to everybody every morning. Uh, you need this or need that. How, or how that. important? is that job. The job of looking a man in his eyes or, or a woman, telling them hello, that you matter as a person. I'm happy that you're breathing oxygen with me today and I'm happy that you're here. Hello. How important is that? That's a, that's a task that many leaders forget about. I think it's very important. One, that so many people um, Try to think of the exact way I want to say that. So many people are so tied up in what they're doing, they don't acknowledge other people's around them. And I think saying that to them, first of all, you can tell if they're having a bad day, mm -hmm. how they answer you, mm -hmm. and then what the, what uh, it sets. I think the the attitude for that day, and also they know that. You, you know, that you're not mad about something or coming and throwing stuff across the shop or, you know, ranting and raising and stomping around. I mean, I don't So do you mean that. the stuff we see on TV is not real? Throwing uh, a wrench on the other uh, side of the shop uh, and kicking a hole in the wall and... That's, that's ridiculous. Doing burnouts. Uh, that's ridiculous. That's you mean you don't do burnouts in these Ferraris on that back street just... <laughs> Maybe not, huh? No. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, but no, I, I think it, every morning, you know, acknowledging your staff and the people around you that's uh, working with you 
I, I have a, a thoughts about or a, my whole staff. I don't think of it. They're working for me. Mm -hmm. They're working with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think a lot of times in in a lot of businesses, they think of the staff as like uh, you're below me. Mm -hmm. No, that's the wrong attitude. Tool in the toolbox. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. And so, uh, so there's a there's a young builder listening to this. There's a manufacturer because you manufacture as well, who's looking to expand their product line and ramp up what they have created. What would be your word and, and your advice uh, as it pertains to staffing and finding the right people? Because you don't want to just have talented people that are jerks. You have great people that have great talent. Well. Your whole staff has to work together as a team. And I see lots of times you'll have a shop where they, they have a lot of staff. And when you get past eight persons per person, you have to have management. And you just have these layers of management. And I think a lot of, I don't have that because that creates sometimes animosities in people. Mm -hmm. Because you know I'm 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 the foreman and you're just the worker bee, and it goes to people's heads. And what happens? You you, you create an animosity is created in the shop that you don't need, and that affects the product that you're working on. And, and, and it also affects productivity. And when I say the product, it, it affects the quality of the product attitudes. And now, as we talk about that product, you have a reputation with awards to back it up, a reputation for building and restoring some of the finest Ferraris that we've ever seen. Tell us about some of these accomplishments. Uh, do you know anything about that Ferrari versus Ford? Oh, yeah. 856. Yes. Somebody restored that car. You know that? Yeah. Yeah, it was, you know, it's a janitor lives in Texas. <laughs> now, tell the, us about some of those serial numbers and tell us about okay. some of those cars well, that you have been blessed to touch. Well, it's not just me blessed to touch, it's my whole staff has had a major part in it. It's, surround yourself with um, a great staff it is not one person knows everything about a car to, to, to do that. I don't. I mean, I have certain talents that I succeed in or accelerate in, and then I have other guys that work with me or my staff. They have talents that I don't have. Mm -hmm. You put all this together, you create a team. You have to have a team to do the things we do. But back to and the And you have a great team. Uh, yes, I have an incredible team. Amazing. And um, they've been with me a long time. I mean, I had two to retire last year. One was with me 36 years and one over 20 years. And I have another one, he's semi-retiring. He's with me, been with me over 40 years. That's the trimmer. Yes. And then I've got several others that's uh, been with me over 30 years. And... Tell us some of the creative things you do from an HR perspective that I, it blew my mind. You've been doing flex hours for almost 40 years. Tell us a little bit about that and the flexibility and okay. the changes you've made and that you really listen to your team. Well, um, two of the best things that I ever did was putting air conditioning in the facility and that was in 88. And then going to what I call uh, flex time and also in that same window going from a five-day work week to a four-day work week. So that gave my workers, my staff, a, a, an extra day off. And my thoughts about it is trading, um, I, I make a joke about it, I traded Wednesday for another Saturday. <laughs> because Thursday is normally Friday for us. Right. And doing that is, um, it created a bunch of different things. One, you've got less utility cost. You have, you have less time start up and stop time. And there's several other things that come into it that it uh, 
like if we have to do maintenance on the building for some reason, I can have that done on a Friday. That's something that workers can come in and do Friday, Saturday, and not disrupt the workflow with the, with the cars. I love it. And then the other thing with what I did, or with flex time, that's what I call it, is I let all the guys uh, arrange their schedule when they come to work and get off around their lives. That's awesome. And I have some that come into work at five in the morning, but they leave a lot of times at five in the afternoon or three, four. Some that come at six, seven, eight thirty, nine. And doing that, it lets them work their lives not around coach works, but uh, coach works around them. And it doesn't. Your 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 genius goes beyond the ability to make a fender out of a flat sheet metal, but it goes also into HR. I believe you're a real automotive genius when it comes to that. Tell us a little bit about two things you shared to me that just blew my mind. I thought it was powerful. One, when you talked about we make mistakes, and oh. it's not a mistake. <laughs> it's not a problem to it leaves the shop. And then you talked about. Nobody knows everything. It's proper to research every car. Talk to us about more about that and how you interact with your guys as it pertains to that. Well, first of all, making mistake, everybody makes mistakes. If somebody says they don't make mistakes, watch out, they're not telling you the truth. <laughs> the next thing is, when you make a mistake, you have to learn from it. Now, and my staff, they make a mistake, hey, we make a mistake. Let's learn from it. But if we make the same mistake three times, well, the second time we're gonna talk about it. Third time, it never happens. But if that did, we're gonna have just Jesus talk. <laughs> and when I make a mistake, I'll be the first one to tell you. Yeah. You know, and I make mistakes. Yeah. But making mistakes is what, when you learn from it, but it's not a mistake until it leaves the building. If you know it's a mistake and you let it leave, and it could be something that's tragic. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I say tragic, I'm talking about a safety issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, and I'm a nutcase about the way we go about doing the cars. First, they've gotta be safe. Second, they've gotta function and work. Third, they make it pretty. But sometimes you have customers there more into wanting to make it pretty and kind of make it function, but not make it safe. I'm not your guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, some of the other other things with um, with uh, the staff is back to flex time a little bit. I know is um, as long as they put their time in and get it done, and and we all work together as a team. Where it all comes back, back, you know, full circle. When, when I met your office assistant, the first thing she shared is he is meticulous, and you certainly are. Tell me, go back into that a little bit and talk about how one you give your clients a promise date or or an expected date or or a goal that you can keep yourself accountable, and you, they can keep you accountable, but also how you then backdate the calendar. You know that each guy is 2,200 hours, and then you take those hours, there's so many weeks and so many days, and tell us a little bit more about that a little bit. Well, scheduling is a huge thing, and you can get over promised pretty easy. And you know, there's a lot of cars that you, you want to do, but the customer comes and says, hey, I assume can you do it? And I said, well, it'd be a year and we could start on it and it'll take a couple of years to do it. And you get some people, they're impatient. Hmm. And well, you know, in a lot of shops I see, they'll get a car in the door and they'll tell the customer, it says, you know, I can get going on it. And they take it partially apart, sets in the corner for a year, a year and a half. Nothing happens. The customer gets aggravated and it kind of leaves a bad taste in their mouth, which I think is not good for the industry. I don't I care. Agree. I don't care what kind of car you're doing, whether it's a it's a Chevrolet, if it's a Ford, or if it's a 
Ferrari, a Jaguar, or whatever. You paint a picture for a lot of people, it's not good. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the industry, it starts with the letter I, and you also talk about a powerful word that begins with I, integrity. Doing the right thing when nobody's watching. Always just being above board. Talk about that. Well, it's, um, there's, there's a lot to say about that. Making promises that you can't keep and is uh, how you get to certain levels with things is um, don't don't paint a picture for the customer or make promises when I say make promises if you promise it's going to be done on a certain day it's got to be done on that window whether you're going to a rally a race a show date or it, it may be something that you're doing a car that's special uh, to that person and their their daughter or son's getting married and they want that to be part of it because it's a big deal. No, oh, it's a huge deal. Yeah. And uh, irreplaceable. All right. And the way you talk, the way I know about how to do the calendar, yeah, to do a project can take anywhere from five, six thousand, eight thousand man hours. Mm. And you say, well, how can it do, be that? Well, when you take it, when you touch every piece on the automobile and it's all put back together, there's thousands and thousands of parts. We're and, talking uh, hand built, not machine built. Oh, no. Not robot built. You got robots no. back there? I'm the robot. <laughs> I clean the, I'm the janitor. <laughs> I'm the robot. But uh, having um, uh, Missing a, a show date or a date is can just it's not good. And we talk about shows and yeah. you've you've done them all. Who's oh. the creme de la creme? What 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 is the show that when clients come here they say he can get me there. I know no matter where I go in this world, he can get me there. And not only can he get me there, he can get me across that stage. And he can get me a hundred points. What's yeah. that show? What's your what's the creme de la creme show of this industry? Well, that's Pebble Beach. Yeah. You ever been there before? Yeah, thirty six times. Yeah. In a row. Yeah. We didn't go this last year because of the little situation of the pandemic and they canceled the shows. That would have made thirty seven in a what row. What an accomplishment. And um, being there, I've had cars on the grass out of 36 years, 33 years. Awesome. And gone across the ramp 54 times. Awesome. Yeah, uh, we had Do more you remember the first time you went? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, the first time I went was in... Uh, Describe that to us, tell uh, us about it. Was in uh, 74, and, uh, no, 174. It was, uh, yeah, it was 74, duh few years after being in business. Right. Anyway, um, when we went and we took a car and um, it was the first year of the international uh, meet at Pebble Beach and Freud was the mark. And we didn't have a car there that year, but that's the first time to go to that show back kind to back. soak it all in. Oh, it was over the top. And um, when you saw those cars, what did you think? Oh, well, I'd done cars for customers years before, and they took the cars, but never was could afford to go or had to know about it, learn about it. Yeah. And um, it was it was an incredible experience. And then the next year, um, I took my 212 there, and um, uh, I won the class. Wow. First year you soaked it in, the next year you came back and said, ah, I think I'll win my class. Well, it's a little more to it than that. Huh? <laughs> a little bit more to it than that. That's because pretty awesome. It's, pretty uh, awesome. Because that year when we took the car, it, I didn't show it at Pebble Beach, but I had it, it was judged at uh, the International Ferrari meet, and I didn't win anything. Hmm. I was going, because I'd been working on this car several years, and anyway, I figured, you know, I, Kind of like, you know, uh, you know it all. Yeah. Well, yeah. it'll make you real humble real quick. Mm. You got your butt kicked. 
Yeah. And coming home, bring what, the what car. What do you say you tell them when you go there, let's play what? Let's play cars. Let's play cars. I like to play cars. <laughs> but um, anyway, came home and I was kind of really bummed out. And I, I, I wasn't going to go back. Not to Pebble Beach, but big Ferrari shots. And I got to thinking about it. I said, nah, I'm going to come back. We're going to play some cars. We're going to play some cars. So we fixed all the things they said was wrong with the car that got judged. Entered at Pebble Beach the next year and won the class. Wow, that's absolutely awesome. And that just set me on fire. Oh, man. And um, what, while we're talking about that, going to deeper, as you talk about this research, I thought it was also powerful. And you talk about that you have to know the history of the car. And when you're doing a one-off car, there's not a lot of comparison because it's a one-off car and you have to go into the history and find the history because they may place something differently in a certain spot to make it a one-off and that an unassuming judge, no harm, may or may not know. But it's also your responsibility as a builder when you're unveiling a car in that type of setting um, to know the history and be able to prove and explain that history. Talk about that a little bit. Well, the history with one-offs, and not just one, uh, one-offs, it could be a car they made 10 of, mm -hmm. and that's still pretty close to it. And they may have done something really special to one of those 10 that's different from the rest of what the coach builder would have done, because Ferrari had basically 15 coach builders, but 12 of them were, did more than one car. And uh, we have a car like the 375 in the background. It's a one-off. It's got a three, 375 mm chassis. I'm talking about the, this one behind you. And um, it's a Ghia body. And Ghia did a lot of really, I'm ahead of its time with design, other things that they did that was a little different. And um, what we have to do on restoring something like that is look at historical photographs. Hmm. And one thing that I see a lot of um, shops do is uh, they'll have a photograph that'll be in a book that may be in, written by a well-known author, but they took a photograph of a car that someone had restored and didn't restore it correctly. It's inappropriate. It's not appropriate for well, the history. It's not, it wasn't the way it started life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they'll restore the car and they think they did it right. Mm -hmm. Because each one of the coach builders had a different, um, oh, I'm gonna call it signature. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. the, way that, the way they did the welding, or the way they may attach the body to the chassis, uh, the type fasteners they used, uh, just certain uh, little quirks. Mm -hmm. And so doing something like that on researching it, you need to know what coach builder it was and what uh, the photograph that's period. Period photographs are, and that was a mistake that I made with my 212. I was looking at the photographs in books that had been written and restored part of it looking at those photographs and they were wrong. You did it correct to the photograph. Yeah, I did the like problem the, the, the well, photograph was wrong. Well, what somebody had done to uh, one of those cars in the past and took a photo of it, and you take it in a book and take it for gospel. Well, it's not. Hmm. So period photographs uh, are huge. Are they, are they hard to find? Oh, yeah. Period, I bet. Well, sometimes they're not out there. And the way we find a lot of them is in books and then finding some of them with historians. There are several historians that um, you can contact and they'll sell you photographs and things. And you can have one photograph that's worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the photographs can be expensive. Wow. But you've, you've got that photograph and that's your roadmap to fix the car properly or back the way it started live. And that's research that's that's huge, and then when we're doing all that research, we compile all this, and then when the car's completed, and it goes to the show, we'll have this book that we put together that shows all these historical photographs 
of certain things with the car. That's awesome. Because a lot of times the judges, they may question you, well, did the car have Marshall headlights in it or did it have Prello headlights in it? You need to know that answer. Oh yeah, so you have a photo and it, it, there they are. Did it have fog lights on it or did it have certain marker lights on it? A picture of the gauges, because sometimes the, the gauges uh, or the gauges in this car are totally different than any of the rest of the Ferraris. But it's back to what the coach builder did. Now how helpful is it to go to other shows? Just like you went to Pebble Beach, you didn't have a car that first year in 74. Talk, talk about the shows you go to in Europe and maybe even the shows you go to in Vegas. Well, I like to go to shows because you know, I'm always a nutcase about learning about things. And I like to, to see what other people do and all that, but we go to shows, we go to Amelia Island, we go to Pebble Beach, we go to, uh, um, to <coughs> Cavallino, which is a uh, all, pretty much all Ferrari show. And then they, we go to Italiano, that's another show in California. We go to Quail, which is another show in California. That one's all all these shows are in California back to back on Pebble Beach weekend. That's what they call it now. Mm -hmm. And I think now there's like five or six shows that weekend. And plus... Uh, it's a full week. Oh yeah, plus auctions going on. Uh, there's like four or five different auctions going on at the same... during different times of those different days, the historical races, uh, a lot of clubs. And I'm sure you're Unlike most people, you're very busy. Oh yeah, uh, that we everybody's trying to get a piece of you. Well, no, not really. Uh, as um, when I say not really, I mean if we take a car there, I'm focused on what that's what we got to take care of. Mm -hmm. It's not something you go there and you you have fun every day. You no, know? mm -hmm. it's 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 you got to be on board every day. You're the caretaker of that car. Oh yeah, yeah. But um, but some of the other shows in Europe is going to uh, Bagatelle. I've done that. We've done that a couple of times. We won Bagatelle Best to Show, wow. and then uh, another one. We had another car there, and then having some cars at Retromobile on on uh, uh, that's it's it's a that show is like kind of like SEMA sort of, where all kinds of manufacturers have stuff and uh, clubs and that that show that's i've done that one uh, 23 times wow i, I find it interesting in, that's in paris that you're a tourist restoration um a builder and that when you go to sema one of the things that catches your attention <laughs> are big old lifted trucks and well, that are just sky high and that and that you love all the main fairs. talk about sema well, and that show and sema uh, we've been going there um, it's about eight years now we didn't make it last year because it was canceled. And then the year before that, we missed it because um, I've got a bunch of friends that do the F1 race in Austin, and it's also the same time. Mm. And they bugged me for like five or six years to go. And I says, okay, we're gonna, we'll go with you guys and hung out with, with them at the F1 race in Austin. And one of the other things, another show we go to, and I'm coming up to SEMA, you're talking about getting off the airplane and picking up their suitcase going out the door the next day is going to Italy to Padua and that's another show that's like SEMA but it's all cars car parts manufacturers uh, of all all types I mean Ferrari has a display there Mercedes has a display there it's it's pretty incredible wow and and it's it's basically a big swap meet too Mm. So, so you always buy when you go? Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and certainly you learn something. Oh yeah, I mean, and, and going, going to Padua is, uh, is a huge deal. And it's a show that's only uh, four days or five, it's, it's, it's five days. Now, now speaking of the shows, which is gathering and coming together, mm -hmm. given the context of what we have going on in 2020 now and 2021, mm -hmm. with this COVID-19 and um, so much sickness and, and, and how do you fight this enemy you cannot see. So individuals are separating and quarantining. How have you been affected? And so that's the first part. And the second part is 
How do you think we go forward, especially with shows and how we normally do businesses? Well, I'll answer that. I want to, I want to finish answering and going to SEMA. I'm, I'm talking about, and when we go to Paris, we go through Paris into retro, and, and that's when we go, go to retro. But then we go on another, that's retro is in February, and then we go again in uh, uh, end of October is when uh, uh, Padua is on. We're home for one day, and then we're off to off to SEMA. Oh wow! And going to SEMA uh, is not just the trucks, but the uh, all the products there, and yeah. going for the equipment and tools and gadgets. And I'm a nutcase for. Uh, for all that and then learning about new products and then yeah, you say you like the uh, hot new product showcase oh yeah that one's great I mean some of the stuff that you see there that comes out that's you can touch it feel it it's not like looking on the internet or a catalog and and I bought equipment there every year I go and a lot of the equipment manufacturers if you make a deal at the show it can be a huge savings mm -hmm and not just have your hands on it, but uh, you can hear it, feel it, see it, touch it, and you can, it, it's, it's over the top. And then the other things is not just the trucks, but Hot Rod Alley and all the stuff that you can see there. But SEMA, uh, is, it's so huge and there's so many things to see that before we go there, I've, I've already got maps of all the halls and what things I want to go see first, second, and third. And there's no way you can see that in one 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 trip. Yeah, just hope it's over the top. No, it's there's no way you can see it in four days. Yeah. But uh, but that show is uh, uh, is one of my favorites. Let, let me and we're gonna go back to COVID nineteen in a moment, but let me ask you another question <clears throat> as we talk about SEMA and we talk about some of these great shows. There's this huge debate. It's almost like the Hatfields and the McCoy. There's a fight between restoration and modification. Between restoration and over-the-top resto mods. Talk about that because I know you're curious and you like the history of the car and the timeless beauty of the car. I mean, you showed me that 59 Mercedes. Or was it 57? 57. 57 Mercedes. It looks like a 2017 Mercedes. I mean, <laughs> the, the beauty is just timeless. Oh, yeah. So how do you reason and how you deal with restoration versus this chop it up and make it something that's never been before? Talk about that a little bit. Well, if you, if you have a really special one-off car, and you're gonna cut it up and make a resto rod out of it. I think that's kind of sad, mm -hmm. and I'm not against it. I mean, there's that's a whole different culture, maybe you want to call it, but it's not something that it, it's kind of cool in, in some of the creation things you can do. But one of the downsides is it's got electronics which is can be a big trouble and how safe is it when you do some of the modifications because some of the stuff i see they take one front end from this car or that car and they put it together and they do this and they do that and it's going mm, i don't know how safe that'd be if it was in a crash mm -hmm. and sometimes is it can just go I'm not going to say too far, but it gets out of control. Mm -hmm. And I, <clears throat> I like, I see so many muscle cars uh, that was in the 60s and early 70s. They put a hot motor in it out of something else, and it'll have horsepower, 800 horse or 1,000 horse. And you now the car had three or 400 horsepower when it was new, and it was plenty hot then. So. <laughs> why? Why? I, my, sometimes I just shake my set, head and just go, "Why?" But everybody has their own. We talked earlier about dreams or whatever is, mm -hmm. and that, if that's what you want, that's cool. And we but, talk about. But it's uh, not something I would be interested in wanting to do for somebody. 
I like that. I, I, I like the part about knowing your niche and knowing what you do. Let's come back a little bit deeper. Of course, I'm here on behalf of Armo, the Automotive Restoration Market Organization, a council of SEMA that is committed to the preservation and promotion of the timeless beauty and history and, and rich automotive culture of these, these timeless pieces. How would you define restoration? What is restoration? What, is it, what does it mean to restore a car? Um, that's a good question. I think restoration a lot of times is misunderstood what restoration really is and I see cars that are, they say it's been restored well to me what restoration means you take every piece of that automobile apart it's it's uh, cleaned repaired replaced and put back together by the way it was started life and a lot of times, we, we improve on a, a lot of areas. And most of the time... Or most of the time is going to be because of safety. Well, safety is... functions. Safety and function is huge. But sometimes when certain cars were made, and what we learn with it, it may have... Well, let's say like the brakes. The brakes are pretty important. And we might update something a little bit. You'd never know it by looking at it, but making it safer. This is like the, a lot of the, the engines. I mean, they look the same on the outside, but we may not put the original brand of pistons in it. We'll have pistons made that are forged that are a lot better alloys and things. And other uh, head gaskets are, are a big problem. Things of that nature will make it better that it's going to last longer and, and it's going to be safer. And then another one is, is fuel systems mm -hmm. and fuel lines, and especially with the gas with the alcohol in it, because the alcohol is kind of an enemy with old cars, because the alcohol eats up the, the Zamac, which is pop metal, and the carburetors, and other things that it causes. It eats up rubbers and eats up the fuel lines, so you have it to... It makes a mess. It makes a big problem. And you have to deal with that. And we do certain things to fix that so it's, it not becomes a, a safety hazard it's, it's with, with something. And, but putting the car back the way it started life, I think is important because you preserve it for future generations to see how it really is. And if you taking something and making a hot rod out of it, or restro rod, or whatever you want to call it, then if you have a car that's a one-off or just a few cars and you do that to you spoil that example that's going mm -hmm. to be brought back mm -hmm. and um, but as far as uh, doing street rods i've done street rods in the past and i like i like street rods don't get me wrong about you know about restoration part of it and and doing that but again back to the restoration to say what it means to some people is, you know, it gets a, a sand and spray and a new seat covers and a, a carpets in it and we change the oil in it and clean the detail of the engine part and we restored it. That's a lot of people, that's their thoughts. But back again is taking every nut and bolt apart, seeing what it's got to have, do the proper finishes back on things and put it all back together. And then once you put it back together, it can't be a deal where uh, you got to test drive it. And I see so many restoration places. They, they'll have five miles on it, and they'll take it to the show, and it's having all kinds of problems. And what we do here is when we build an engine, it's, on the, it's put on the dyno, and we run it with the gearbox, run it as a unit, unless it has a transaxle, then that's a different story. But we'll still run it, but not with the transmission. And we'll put anywhere from 500 to 1,000 miles on it in the dyno. Hmm. But I run, a, I run the dy my dyno where we run water through it that's cold water. It's just like it was with the radiator hooked up, not just running cold water through it. Because a lot of places build engines, they'll put it on a dyno, they'll run it for maybe an hour, and it's not going to blow up, but it's not broke in. 
Right. And basically what we do is break the engine in on the dyno. And if it has other problems with water pump or fuel pump or this is leaking or that, we can fix it on there. And then after we've got it broke in, then we know we're now set. And when you get the car finished, do you spend some road time with it? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's just part of it with the, with the dyno. But when we have it on the dyno, and after we ran it, broke it in, then we'll come back and retorque the heads, run the valves, check everything, and then we'll seal up the valve covers where it doesn't leak, and then we'll run it a little bit more, and we'll take it off, and it's ready to go in the car. And that's the stage really where that's, that's, that's where we are right now with this 275. Mm -hmm. And uh, once we have done that, it's installed in the car. Then we'll drive it anywhere from, oh, 150 to 300 miles. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure it's right before you give it to your client. It's got to be bulletproof. Mm -hmm. And when you, we've done lots of cars, and let's say it's going to go to the Tour de France or the Mille Amelia or wherever and it's got to get it's going to get on the airplane I don't need that phone call you know at five in the morning and uh, the car's got a problem Houston we have a problem that's never happened mm. and but it's still an old car don't get me wrong because things can break I mean things can fail but if you've done everything with that you can do with it you, should be fine you put every I mean fuel lines rubber lines uh, Tires, brakes, new bolts, new this. Chance of it having a problem is going to be very, very small. Mm -hmm. But it can still occur. And let's talk about your, um, well, let's go back to COVID. Talk okay. about COVID and uh, shutdowns and that's affected, you know, many businesses and all that. So on the one hand, how has your business been affected? On the other hand, what do you think about what's going on in the world? And then maybe I'm running out of hands. And then the third thing would be, <laughs> okay. um, where is the industry headed? Because this is a touchy industry. We talk, we meet, we hang out, we drive cars, we cruise together. What are your thoughts about how COVID is affecting the industry and has affected the industry? Well, the way it's affected the industry, and, and well, part of that is different parts of the country, depending on where you, where you are. I think, you know, if you're states up north where there's more people can more uh, people uh, in one spot like new york city or chicago or los angeles i think that's going to those areas are going to be affected more than areas like in texas and what what, what some of the ways that are affected is manufacturers you know deliveries and getting raw materials uh, things that vendors do for you that they're shut down. And that's affected us a little bit, but we've never been shut down or stopped or had any situations. And basically, uh, I think that's due to several things. We're, we're pretty much street smart. We're not near a big, huge metropolitan area. There are some cases in this county, but uh, it's not like it is in Dallas County or other counties near. And here we don't have a stream of people coming in and out like at the convenience store. Basically, um, it's the UPS and FedEx and, and DHL and the postman and the parts store and the paint store is pretty much it, the welding store. And we're, uh, we, we, uh, We're, we're smart about it. Yeah. Not, not, not what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we don't, we don't uh, uh, do silly or stupid things. Now the, now the shows have been canceled. Yes. Uh, do you think they're coming back soon? And if they don't come back anytime soon, how, does, how do you think that affects the industry and at least the morale of what we do? If there's no pebble beach, <clears throat> how can you? showcase your car on the grass well Pebble Beach's schedule is still is still on and Amelia Island that Concor uh, is in March and they pushed it to May and uh, Cavallino is January and they pushed it to April and some of the other shows they've pushed farther out 
And I think the COVID thing at some point will be passed. And the deal is with the shows not coming back. The shows, the major ones will come back, but they're going to be a lot different because I think some of them with their sponsorships with, you know, big manufacturers is not going to be what it's been in the past, and that's going to affect the show. And the way affecting the industry could be really huge, but I think there will be other things that will pop up that weren't there before. Other shows get creative because people love to bring the cars. Mm -hmm. and they love to, you know, show them, brag about them, do rallies, do, you know, drive, you know, drives and stuff like that. Um, that'll come back. Yeah. It'll come back. And one of the, one of the things that, you know, people, um, you know, they, they're going to have fun with the cars. Right. One way or the other. One it, of the, that's it's going it, to happen. I think what way it may affect the industry some is uh, with not just with supplies, but with uh, the cost. It's going to drive the cost is going to go up. That's inevitable, and that's going to I think probably hurt it some, and especially cars that are not as uh, I'm not going to say significant. Not as have as much value, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know. If you put a hundred grand into a project, or, and it's worth forty thousand no. dollars, yeah, that's. Yeah. But some people are still going to do that because hey, it, it may be that was my grandpa's car, and I learned to drive in it, and all that, and I and. The it's person, a little bit easier when it's a it, significant historical historical yeah, piece. Yeah, it's, it's a little a, bit different to put yeah. the money in. Well, it has uh, significance or. Mm -hmm. or special things or memories about it and there's going to be people that's going to do that because they have the means to do it but then there's going to be other people that don't have the means to do it and it's not it's not going to happen but with so many manufacturers making reproduction parts and pieces uh, it's probably going to affect them too with sales I would think. Bob you're always working you're always around these cars how do you get away from it? What do you do when you're not building a Ferrari? Well, there's a lot of different things. Uh, working on my ranch, uh, messing with my horses. Uh, I've always got projects. Now you're a championship uh, champion breeder as well. Well, I don't know about champion breeder. We got some nice horses. <laughs> so, but um, doing all those things, and I, I like art projects that I did, some sculpture things. And then Rain and I, we, we like to go dancing. And can you dance? You got two left feet or you well, can, can you dance? Yeah, I can get by. <laughs> Lorraine's my fifth dance teacher, how we kind of met. And um, anyway, uh, she uh, teaches all different types of dance instructor that she does. And, but we like, we enjoy doing that. Uh, listen to music, I, I like, uh, all types of music and um, playing checkers, uh, looking at books or mag car magazines, or and then a few gun magazines. I like to, <laughs> to look at some of those and and um, writing lists and thinking about other things. I like to travel and go places and see things. I like music. I like to visit museums. I've been probably. Probably over 200 museums around the world. Which one is your favorite? All of them. You know, what I, what I like about museums is is learning about things and cultures and everything from golf museums to car museums, uh, uh, airplane museums, uh, all types of museums. And I guess probably the, the st strangest one that we've ever, we've ever been to was the Sura Museum in Paris. And it, it didn't stink, believe it or not, but it, <laughs> I always like interesting things, how things work. So, but uh, all of those things. And then um, um, traveling is seeing all different kinds of, when we do road trips, if we're driving down the road and we see something that's kind of interesting, we'll turn around and come back. That's pretty cool. To, just to see it. Yeah. So, and then, um, 
like when we go to go to SEMA, one of the things we like to do there uh, is go to a lot of the shows. They have their live shows and stuff is really cool that you don't see anywhere else in the world. And um, just uh, having a good time. Bob, tell me about your systems. You're known for being meticulous. You have an uh, amazing system. When I walked in this shop, I mean, I've been in a lot of shops, and I think my shop is clean. It is clean. And when I walked in here, I just took one step in, and I was like, wow, it's just a hospital. It is, <laughs> it is clean. It, uh, it, 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 everything is uh, sanitized. Everything is orderly. Everything has its place. Everything has a system. And not just in an OCD way, this is here, this is there. I mean, it's really, really functional and really, really efficient. And I could see myself working in here. Like, you could actually work right here because what you need is right there in that particular area, that particular section. So tell me about more about your systems and your process. Well, it took years to develop it. And in the beginning, we would take things apart and you'd put it in little trays or this, and that became turned into a train wreck. And it came up with the idea of putting things in baggies. And then you write on the baggie what it is. And then we've graduated, well, how do you keep up with which baggie goes to this car or something happens with or it's how it's stored. So I came up with a numbering system on them. And that numbering system goes back to the worksheet that all the uh, help does. And that, that was another thing that was a problem. Because you have a worksheet, then you have a time card. Well, in the early days, sometimes the time sheet got lost, but the time card never did. So if you don't have a way of billing the customer what they did, work, money's going out the door. So I came up with the idea, hmm, we'll just make that the same piece of paper. Hmm. And I developed a sheet and everybody turns in a time card in the sheet every day. And if the sheet don't match, then we'll have a little talk. But the sheet always matches. And on the sheet, it has where it's got the job number. And what I came up with the job numbers is uh, whatever the two initials of the customer were is the first letters and then the number. And mm -hmm. we go start at one, two, three, and we've since we started that, we've been over oh, over 2,000 jobs, 3,000 jobs. Wow. But the Customer number. name and number. Mm -hmm. And that stays with everything related to that call. Mm -hmm. oh, that's pretty cool. And then um, what happens, too, is uh, Cheryl, every day, puts in the worksheets from the day before. So when it comes payroll time, then it doesn't... A crunch day trying to get everything in the computer. And then another thing related to that is uh, and billing. And then when we pay, the guy, when the guys get paid. And I don't hold them, a lot of companies hold them back two weeks or a week or that. They're never held back more than one day. And I'm explain that. And we bill the customers every two weeks. We don't bill them once a month or what the calendar is. It's every two weeks and that keeps the cash flow going. And we try to build them opposite to when we pay the guys. And the guys get paid every two weeks. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, what happens with that? Cash, cash flow in this business is, is oh, it's, crucial. It's, oh, big time. Yeah, yeah. Big time. Yeah. You got to have it coming in on time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, what we do with that, building the customers every two weeks, if they don't pay within that two-week period, you and that we'll, we'll bill them one more time and then we'll stop mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but that never happens yeah yeah it never happens but then on another other note but how when we pay the guys so is they well, a lot of people Bob before you go too far a lot of young builders uh, they think to do what Bob Smith does all they have to do is know how to make a, a panel on a car when this is a major business and oh, yeah. you must know how to lead people, manage money, deal with legalities, mm -hmm. deal deal with uh, deal all with people, deal all. with clients, and then uh, all the regulatory agencies. That's uh, and it's 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 
not going to get any easier, but, but back on paying the guys that makes it good for them, when they get paid every two weeks, when they leave on Thursday, they get their paycheck every two weeks. But I ended there, when our week starts and stop is on Wednesday, every other Wednesday. And then that gives Cheryl time to put everything in the computer on Thursday, do all the checks, and then the checks and everything are ready by three. Mm -hmm. And they're only held one day behind. And, and that's great, because that, they get their money, mm -hmm. uh, they're made whole, mm -hmm. and um, that's awesome. And then so. back to the job numbers, the way that works, when we get to uh, 99, 999, it starts over. And then the job numbers, we may have a car that we restore and then we take care of it for the customer. And a lot of times that job number will stay with that car for as long as they have it, rather than recreate another job number. And then what we do with all of the, the, by the billing works, we keep all the job sheets. I never throw them away. Now, Bob, you also talk about within your system that you put safety number one, that's first base. Absolutely. Second base is function. You Absolutely. want it to function, and then the, you get it. We're gonna make it pretty, but we're not gonna make it pretty first, mm -hmm. and we're not gonna put pretty above function or above safety, and in the midst of rest, restoring a beautiful Ferrari, if it had, say, a plywood floor, mm -hmm. you're not gonna put the plywood floor back because it's not safe, Correct. and if it has a exhaust system that comes down the side and the body wraps around that in a way and, and that body is tacked to the frame and you got to do an adjustment there and you can't get there you're going to figure out a way to make this function but keep the beauty talk about that a little bit well <coughs> a lot of things that we talked earlier about parts with the engines or function things like that that we figure out how you could take it back apart and still work on it and put it back together. And that happens some with the, with the Ferraris, not too much. Now some of the race cars, early race cars and some of that, it's a little more difficult. But street cars are pretty much straightforward. But some of the stuff you have to do sometimes to take the engine out, it's not just a simple task to get to certain things. So with clutches and flywheels and that's something that we try to improve on if it's if possible. And Bob, you open your shop up to us, and I know you don't do this for everyone, so we certainly do thank you and appreciate you for that. But it's not just that you open up your shop, you open up your life, you open up your spirit, you share your mind. Uh, you're always giving of yourself, and if you win best of show, and the person you beat, you don't mind if they open up the hood, and. Yeah. Have a look, see, and what what what's this lesson that you can teach us about just being free, sharing, being transparent? There's nothing to hide. Well, there's several things with that. One, if someone has a, it won't show you or tell you what they're doing. They're doing either one or two things or both. They don't know what they're doing, and they're doing something they shouldn't be doing, and they're trying to hide it. The next thing is, when you help your competition and share with them, that makes them better, that makes you better. Because if you're at the top of the mountain or the hill and you win everything, everybody's trying to take you out. And once you get there, then it's harder to stay there. But helping your competition, that helps you be better to help stay there. And in, in my competition, uh, um, beats me, I'll be the first one to congratulate them. And if, if I win, I'm not somebody that's shoving it in everybody's face. I'm very, mm, I don't know. Very gracious with it. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's not something, you know, it, it's all about me. And when we, and we win it, it's not about me, it's about the whole staff. It's a team. And, um, and I, like, I like to share because when you share with people, it helps them, and uh, it makes everything better. I mean, in the world today, 
it's so upside down. It's all about me, 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 me. And they want instant gratitude. And they, they want a position, they want this, they want that. And they don't know what it takes to get there. Yeah. And you know, and I've, I've, I fell on my butt a few times. Well, while you get up, just pull yourself up your bootstraps and get going. Don't, don't lay down and, you know, say, pitiful, pitiful me. That's a bunch of crap. Yeah. Now, some people say that to be successful in this industry, to build a great car, it's all about having plenty of money in the bank and you got to know all the people. Is it about that or is it about hard work, busting your butt? Talk about that a little bit. Well, it's about, oh, a lot of things. Yeah, there's more than one. Um, the main thing is, uh, is back to integrity again. It's about don't promise more than you can do. And if you make a mistake, be the first one to admit it. Don't promise more than you can do. And don't build the customers up where it's a point, or I say don't, don't set them up for a failure. That's a train wreck. And what I mean set them up for a failure, say, oh yeah, we can restore the car, we'll take it to Pebble Beach and we're gonna win everything. No, because what happens is, there's always somebody out there that could, might beat you, and you set it up for a customer. But the way I do it, I explain to them, I said, we'll do everything in our power to do the car, take it there, and do our very best. And, and we have chances of going across the ramp. But if we don't, it's an experience that you'll never have again, unless you go again and again. And it's, it's something that people go there and they have uh, visions or whatever what it's going to be and that and they get disappointed and they get a bad taste in their mouth. Yeah. And I they don't want to go through that. No, I, I think that's bad for our industry. Mm -hmm. Not just going to Pebble Beach, it can be a Mercedes show, a Corvette show, a, a wedding, a wedding, any of that. And, Anniversary. And, oh yeah, absolutely. So. That's one thing, and then having lots of money in the bank, you know, if you're talking about as far as a shop owner, um, having lots of, let me, I'll back up a little bit on that, is any time that you do a, a job for the money, or whatever, do a job because you like the job, and you do a very good job at it, the money will come. M money's basically, a lot of people, put money in the wrong perspective. And they put it in perspective, it, it's power. And it is power to a point, but what money is basically, it's a tool and a convenience. It's nothing more. If you can't put money in those two categories, you need to go think about it. Hmm. I like that. But, uh, you have a lot of things in your toolbox, and there are some young builders that are listening, some young manufacturers are, uh, maybe their manufacturers has been doing it for a while and, and maybe they're second or third generation they want to expand themselves what are some wisdom points what are what are, what are two or three nuggets that you've learned through the years that you can really deposit and we can take it and run with it well if you talk to me very long about things there's four words that i don't use no can't ever quit if you set yourself up with those words in that order, you're setting yourself up for failure. And it's kind of like can't. Can't got his butt kicked, but could. No, I don't. When somebody tells me or they're telling you no, what part of no do you not understand? It's the end part or the old part. Hmm. And then can't is. I, I hear that so many times from so many people. And well, what when I hear that over and over from people. When they say can't, they don't want to. They're mm. lazy. And then ever is um, a word that's, you know, how long will it, will it take? It's going to take forever, forever. Is I, I don't like that word. And then quit. If you, you is quit any time in your vocabulary, you're just setting yourself up for failure. Mm. And so have a can-do attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, have a possibility mind. Think outside of the box. Well, and don't limit yourself. Think, think beyond the box. 
Well, there's four levels of thinking. Talk to them about. And this is the way I, the way I think about things. Is uh, there's flat thinking, there's inside the box, and there's outside the box. Okay, and then. It could be actually five, depending on the way you look at it, it could be five. The next one is thinking outside the sphere, that's four. Five is thinking with no dimension. Hmm. Hmm. I think Bob Smith, there's no doubt about it. You're definitely on level five when it comes to well, thinking. I don't know about that. I've, uh, I've been accused of being crazy, and I said, hell yeah, I've been crazy all my life. Now what do you want to talk about? <laughs> Bob, I thank you so much for allowing me to come into your wonderful establishment. And not only that, but, but into your mind and how you think and your process. Let me tell you something. I'm a better builder. I haven't been here long. I am a better builder. I'm a better thinker. There are some things that I was doing that I thought was right, you confirm that, yeah, you're doing the right thing, keep going that way. But there's some other things that I have not considered. There's some other things that maybe I was thinking in the box, maybe I was out of the box. I got two more levels to go. And so you have really personally impacted me, personally influenced my life and my career and my company in an amazing way. So I certainly, certainly want to thank you personally for that. And I know that those that are listening and watching this, they too will be impacted. I thank you. Well, you're welcome. Oh, my pleasure. I like to share. Thank you. Thank you. It's been, it's been awesome. It's been awesome. I hope you've enjoyed talking with Bob Smith and I sure hope you've learned a lot. I am different. I'm a different person. And that's what happens when you're in the presence of greatness. You change. Something happens, there's, a, there's, a, there's an effect. You can't walk in the sunshine and don't feel anything. You can't walk in the rain and not get wet. And you cannot be in the presence of Bob Smith and not be empowered, not be edified, and not be educated. I hope you enjoyed it. Next time. A lot of people think of the fairy tale. Yeah, yeah. And I'd live the dream. You live you every day. Well, I'm still a janitor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>